Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. When humans first started making audio recordings of music, they were limited as to how long those recordings could be. An original Edison cylinder could hold maybe two minutes worth of music. Therefore, any songs committed to the format had to be two minutes or shorter, otherwise you'd run out of space. When Emil Berliner came along with this flat rotating disc that spun at 78 RPM, capacity increased a little bit. You now had around three minutes for a song before you ran out of space on the side of one of his records. So everyone who wanted to make audio recordings adapted to the limitations of the technology. And this, more than anything else, standardized the length of songs in popular music to around three minutes, something that persists even today. How long are most songs? In the neighborhood of around three minutes. Another thing, in the old days, there was just one version of a song. You wrote it, you recorded it, it was manufactured, sent to the stores, and that was it. But in the 1960s, this too began to change with the rise of the album. Radio stations loved their three-minute songs because it meant that they could get more songs in per hour. But with extra space provided by albums, songs grew longer than the standard three minutes. The only way to get a great but long song on an album onto AM radio, which dominated at the time, you had to make that long song shorter. And this gave birth to the first radio edits. There was a shorter single version and the longer album version. Sometimes there was serious butchery involved, but uh, hey, radio wanted things down to three minutes, so they got it. But why stop there? Couldn't you have multiple versions of the same song destined for different uses? Why couldn't, for example, a short song be made longer or made more interesting with different mixes and instrumentation and arrangements? The original song is, is there. It's the same. It's just that you could add or subtract or rearrange things from the original recording and release that, perhaps expanding the market and maybe the reach for the song and the artist. This gave birth to the remix, an artistic and technological development that took what was once a finished single and turned it into something entirely different. This is the history of the remix. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and we're going to spend this show looking at songs that are deconstructed and reconstructed into new but similar things that can be used for many different purposes. Remixes. The concept of tearing down a song to its constituent parts and then rebuilding it into something different is an art form unto itself. In fact, another term for remixing a song is reorchestration. You can add, subtract, alter, and manipulate things to create something new while still maintaining the song's original DNA. Now, why would you do such a thing? Well, we just went over one way a song could be modified for radio airplay by editing the original into something shorter. That's generally called the single edit. But then there's also something called the radio edit. Broadcasting bodies around the world are very sensitive about songs that contain naughty words that might cause offense and destroy the innocence of children. So what if you have a song that's really, really good and deserves to be pushed as a single, but it has some bad words in it? Well, you perform some surgery carefully editing out or obscuring the naughty word or phrase in the most unobtrusive way possible. Here's an example of what I mean. Let's call up Green Day's Long View from the Dookie album. In the first 50 seconds of the song, Billy Joe Armstrong's vocal drops out. Where it does, you can probably guess what he's singing. That original version, you know, not good for the radio because, well, what about the children? I'm sick of Those vocal edits, which appear a couple of times in the song, were distributed to radio stations so they could play Longview without getting complaints from people worried about the children. Same thing when the video was released. Cutting out a sweary bit like this is effective but kind of crude. My favorite radio edit of all time is this song. It's Battle Flag by Low Fidelity All-Stars. Instead of cutting out the bad word, the remixer added a multiple stutter to the word that followed the naughty one, 
which in case you didn't know, was a big mother F. The result, I would argue, is better than the original. That's what I think. This is the official radio edit. And that's just one remix for that song. In addition to the original album mix, there's something called the Space Raiders mix, the Big Beat Boutique mix, another featuring the original writer of the song, and the Low Fidelity All-Stars mix. I probably missed a few, too, because once you get some people working on a song trying to improve on the original, things can get out of hand fast. Okay, hang on. Before we get too deep into this, we need to cover off some history, and it's still related to radio. The first remixes were done in the 1960s, and they were done with a very specific audience in mind, the AM radio listener. AM radio signals don't have very good sonic properties. The immutable laws of physics make it impossible for an AM signal to carry a lot of deep bass or a lot of crisp highs, and the result is that music on AM sounds thin and tinny. Record companies realized that, so before a single was released, it wasn't uncommon to take the tapes back to the studio and remix the song. The remix engineer turned off the big, rich-sounding studio monitors and instead pumped the music through a couple of relatively junky 5-inch full-range speakers, similar to the kind that you would find jammed into the dashboard of a typical car back in the 60s and 70s. The engineer knew that if he could mix the song to sound good on these crappy little speakers, then it would probably sound great coming out of an AM radio in a car. And that's why a lot of 7-inch releases from the 60s and 70s sound so unnatural and often unbearably bright when you play them on a proper stereo. One of the absolute worst offenders was the 1977 meatloaf hit Paradise by the Dashboard Light. The version on the album isn't the greatest sounding recording, but when the decision was made to release the song as a 7-inch single, things got immeasurably worse. Two big challenges how to make the song pop through an AM radio, and more importantly, how to fit 7 minutes and 56 seconds on one side of a 7-inch single. Step one was relatively easy. Step two involved cutting the grooves on this 7-inch record incredibly close together. The grooves had to be made narrower, and by doing that, you sacrifice how much bass can be stored in those grooves. There was another problem. As the stylus spirals closer and closer to the center of a record, you end up with another physics problem. At the outer edge of a 45, you have a nice long groove that allows you to spread out musical information over a longer path. But as you get closer to the middle of the record, the spiral groove is much shorter. You have to compensate somehow to get all the musical information into a shorter rotation of the record. This is why audio quality suffers. But unless you're playing such a record through a good stereo, you probably won't notice it. After all, this 45 was manufactured for play on AM radio and most likely on cheap turntables. And it was fine. Okay, not great but such were the limitations of the age. Here's some more history. The first modern remixes of records were found in Jamaica in the late 1960s and early 70s. Around 1950, a Jamaican inventor named Headley Jones built a new kind of amplifier. It had a three-band equalizer, which allowed the operator to emphasize or take away low, mid-range, and high frequencies. One of his first customers was a guy named Tom the Great Sebastian. He wired up a turntable and speakers to the amp, and voila! The Jamaican sound system was born. This was 1952, and Sebastian became a star. His biggest rival was Arthur Duke Reed, and soon the island was filled with guys who ran sound systems, these giant portable DJ rigs that were always ready for a party. The goal was to keep everybody dancing, and there was a tremendous amount of competition between the sound system operators to see who could have the biggest and loudest gig and the best toasters. The toasters were the people who did stream of consciousness raps and rhymes over an instrumental bit of the record. Now, 
Where did you get that instrumental record? Using their connections in local recording studios, operators would ask for recordings of the songs with the vocals stripped out, and then the bass turned up, reverb dropped in, or even with some additional instrumental parts. And these mixes were called versions. And often, these sound system operators associated with, like I said, a toaster who would offer these stream of consciousness rhymes over the top of the instrumental mixes, exhorting the dancers to move to the music. Using two turntables and a microphone, songs were remixed in real time, offering surprise and delight to the crowd. And the best mixers, with the biggest sound systems, and the best toasters, became the biggest stars. Sometimes songs would get remixed so much that it became something totally brand new, and the sound system owner gave it a title and claimed it for his own. The same thing would happen in the late 70s in the Bronx with hip-hop. The hack and slice and scratch and wheel and come again of hip-hop DJs created not just only a new form of music, but an entirely new culture. Like the sound system guys, hip-hop turntablists created remixes on the fly. And that is a whole series of programs in itself. Now, let's fast forward from the sound system era in Jamaica to disco. People were heading to clubs in record numbers to dance, and the goal of the DJ was to keep the groove and to keep the party going. The problem was that as soon as you got into the groove of a great song, it was over. The songs were too short for the effect that they needed to create on the dance floor. The first way to cure this was to have two copies of the song, one on each turntable. When one ran out, you seamlessly mixed into the other, back and forth and back and forth until it was time to move on. This is where we meet a guy named Tom Moulton. In the early 1970s, he was at a gay event and sympathized how the DJ had trouble maintaining momentum on the dance floor. And that's when he had a brainstorm. Tom went home and carefully spliced together a long, unbroken version of a song on a Revox reel-to-reel -reel tape machine, adding eight bars here, another 16 bars there. And once it was all done, all you had to do was hit the start button, the play button, and you had five and a half minutes of perfect dance beats. The track we're now hearing, BT Express and Do It Till You're Satisfied, is from 1973, and it may well be the first ever extended remix for the dance floor, and it is rumored to have taken 80 hours to put together. Let's uh, just have a little listen. It wasn't long before other DJs began copying Tom Moulton, and it wasn't long before they were taking these spliced reel-to-reel -reel tapes to pressing plants and creating vinyl records of these mixes. Additional copies were made and given to other club DJs. At first, all these dance mixes were pressed as 7-inch singles. But sometime in 1974, Tom Moulton had a problem. He had a hot new mix that he wanted to debut on the weekend, but the studio he used had run out of 7-inch blanks. So what was he going to do? He asked the engineer, well, could we press this onto a 12-inch blank? And the engineer said, sure, why not? Just remember to play it at 45 instead of the usual 33. And just like that, the 12-inch single was born. The very first track to be pressed this way was All Be Holding by a guy named Al Downing. DJs loved the new 12-inch format. Because they were bigger, they were easier to handle. Because they were heavier, you didn't have to be as careful moving them around. Because the grooves were wider apart, they could store more music, especially bass. And because the lip of the record extended all the way around the circumference of the turntable platter, new moves were invented like slip cueing and eventually scratching. One of the most popular ways to remix a song was to create a long, beat-heavy intro. This made it easy to match the beats with the previous song, so when the mix was made, you couldn't tell where one song ended and the other began. Dance floor integrity was thereby maintained. You can call this the musical equivalent of hair extensions, but the technical term is beat mixing. 
Let's deconstruct one particular 12-inch single. It begins with the rhythm track. And then by surgically excising bits of the song and making copies of that, you could implant them elsewhere to extend the length of the song. It's kind of like adding breadcrumbs to some hamburger to make the meat go further. It also helps if you have access to stems of a song. These are the individual musical elements that, layered together, make up the song. You can either get stems from the original multi-track recording, or you can digitally recreate them for yourself, but that came later. The original version of The Smiths, This Charming Man, was 2 minutes and 43 seconds. But with some tape and a razor blade, maybe a stem or two, New York DJ Francois Kravorkian created the New York Vocal Mix. It was a full three minutes longer than the original and was definitely geared for the dance floor. That's a pretty cool bit of reconstruction by DJ Francois Kravorkian. Unfortunately, he never got the proper permission from the Smiths, and the records were withdrawn. If you had a 12-inch of This Charming Man in the 80s, it was like gold. But then an agreement was reached, and it was given an official release in 1992. Other people were only too happy to get into the remix game. So many, in fact, that in the 80s, we had the golden age of remixes. More coming up. Even though disco had imploded by the beginning of the 80s, the 12-inch extended remix survived. Record labels and artists had awoken to the advantages of dance remixes, and here's why. Number one, it increased the chance of a song reaching a whole new audience beyond radio and record stores. The dance club crowd was there for the picking. Number two, different types of mixes appealed to different dance club crowds. For example, you might be able to win over a rock crowd at a club if you supplied the DJ with a rock remix, you know, lots of guitars and stuff. Or if a new style of music appeared, a song written for one genre could be transported into another. Think, for example, of any familiar songs you've heard that have been remixed into dubstep bangers. And number three, issuing remixes was a way of getting the public to buy the same song once, twice, three times, four times, or more. No early 80s band was better at that last trick than Frankie Goes to Hollywood. In 1984 and 1985, they managed to get people to buy millions of copies of at least 13 different versions of Relax. Frankie Goes to Hollywood was really good at the remix trick. Between 1984 and 1987, Frankie released just seven singles, but those singles were remixed and re-released again and again and again. Those seven singles stretched into three dozen remixes. Very low overhead, big profits. As the 80s progressed, new technology became available that made making remixes more interesting. It began with two sophisticated keyboard devices, the Fairlight and the Synclavier. The new keyboards allowed operators to surgically excise a piece of musical material, store it digitally, manipulate it, and then implant it wherever they chose. Frankie and New Order used a Fairlight for their remixes. The Pet Shop Boys used a Synclavier. And they, along with dozens of other bands, began to realize that the original version of a song was only a starting point. With a little imagination and outside input, there were no limits as to what a song could become. The Cure's Robert Smith loved the concept of remixes so much that he had dozens of Cure songs revitalized this way, releasing an entire album of remixes called Mixed Up in 1992. Depeche Mode went even deeper. I once asked Martin Gore how many remixes there were of a song like Behind the Wheel, and he just shrugged. He said, I don't know, 80 maybe? There's the Mega Mix, the Mega Dub, the Extended Remix, the Beatmasters Mix, the Shep Pettibone Mix, a 7-inch Remix, the Casualty Mix, the Prids Mix, oh, and the original Album Mix. Some were the standalone versions of Behind the Wheel, while others incorporated versions of Depeche Mode's cover of Route 66. I have on my shelf a box set of selected Depeche Mode remixes released between 1981 and 2004. 
37 different remixes of 37 different songs. And next to it is another box set released in 2016 with another 28 remixes. Next door to that is a vinyl version, a suitcase-like collection spanning half a dozen discs. Depeche Mode completists require a lot of shelf space. This is called the pump mix of Personal Jesus. More on the story of extended remixes coming up. The biggest remixers were DJs. After all, who better to keep the dance floor jumping? In the beginning, most of the remixes they did were totally unauthorized and therefore illegal. But as the concept caught on, record labels began enlisting these remix experts to create legitimate releases. They started subcontracting this work out to remix specialists, club DJs, record producers, recording studio engineers, and in rare cases, to the artists themselves. Sometimes they were given specific instructions and limited access to the master tapes. Other times, they had carte blanche, complete with the master tapes, and permission to add and record new parts for the song as they saw fit. The only criteria was that the remix they came up with was a new and fresh look at the song. One of the best was a guy named Flood. His real name is Mark Price, and these days his schedule is so full that people book his services a year or more in advance. Not bad for a guy that started out in the music industry as a tea boy. That was his job. He made tea for anybody who happened to be working in the studio. Eventually, he got a job as an engineer at Mute Records, working sessions for bands like Depeche Mode. Within a couple of years, his work was so highly regarded that Brian Eno asked him to help out U2 on the Joshua Tree album. In between album projects, Flood would help people remix singles. Let's have a listen to what he did with a Nine Inch Nails song. This is Head Like a Hole. And he calls this the Opal Mix. From November 1990, the treatment Flood gave to Head Like a Hole from Nine Inch Nails. Trent Reznor loves the possibilities of the remix. In fact, he was so into it that he released albums and EPs full of remix Nine Inch Nails material. He's also performed remix surgery on other people's songs. For a while in the 80s, everybody was having their songs remixed. I remember being in a bar when I heard an extended version of ZZ Top's Legs. Shocking, since that was a proper rock band that had allowed one of their songs to be turned into a dance floor track. Hard to believe now, but such bands just did not do that. You did not create dance floor fodder. Because, well, ZZ Top wasn't meant for dancing, yet they were. When grunge came along, the whole idea of rock-based remixes seemed to recede into the background for a bit. Oh, it was still done for industrial groups, electronic outfits, and a few others. But the trend wasn't as big as it once was. Today, almost anyone can remix a song. All you need is a laptop, a little software, and maybe a couple of stems that you downloaded from the internet. There are so many files floating around online that it's impossible to keep track of them all. Few ever get pressed into vinyl anymore. We've all gone digital. But that means there's more to choose from. Here's one I found. This is called the Two Friends remix of the killer's Mr. Brightside. Jealousy, turning saints into the sea, swimming through sick lullabies, choking on your alibis, but it's just the price I pay. I remember talking to a guy around 2000 when Napster was at its peak. What kind of stuff are you downloading, I asked. Remixes, he said, and the weirder and the crazier the better. These DJs are creating their own special mixes for their own nightclubs and then sharing them online. It's incredible. I got thousands of one-of-a-kind versions of the same song. I don't think we see as many remixes in the alt-rock world as we used to, and I assume that's because after peaking in the late 90s, the number of alt-rock dance clubs went into decline, so no demand, no product. But they are still out there, especially in the form of mashups. The best mashups are mixes of two songs that have no business being mixed together. The odder the juxtaposition, the cooler. My personal favorite is a mashup of Madonna's Ray of Light with Pretty Vacant by the Sex Pistols. Highly recommend it. It's out there. What's available now? Uh, just log on to streaming music platforms and enter remixes and mashups, and you'll be there for quite some time. And to think it all started back in Jamaica with those sound systems. 
There are many ongoing history podcasts available for download. Just pick a download site and go and take as many as you need. My website is a journal of musical things.com. There's a free daily newsletter available to all. And I'm always looking around Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and occasionally TikTok. All emails should go to alan at alancross.ca. Technical production and any remixing is done by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.